Welcome to Slow and Steady, the podcast where you get to follow along as we build products in public. Each week, we'll give you an honest peek into our lives as we share our struggles, our wins, and everything in between. I'm Benedicta, and I'm feeling tired again. <laughs> and I'm Benedict. Today is December 6th. This is episode number 162, and I'm... I'm not... Where's my notes? I don't feel tired. I feel, I feel like organized but maybe not <laughs> I don't, yeah whatever i think you forgot to be to update your uh your host line so i i think i i'm pretty sure i put it in there but who knows okay because <laughs> I, I just it. i just changed optimistic to tired for my line so maybe you just felt optimistic maybe like I last accidentally... week and then forgot to update your since we're alternating I mean, this is hard stuff. Yeah, we're, uh, we're... maybe I'm not as organized. Maybe I'm just <laughs> old and confused and don't know what I'm doing. Anyways, I, I, feel, know. I old, feel like I should I, be organized. Old, there's a keyword. There's a keyword. I can no longer power through. Like before, I could power through almost anything. But now I'm like, oh, I'll do a 10-hour day today. It's going to be fine. Like, I'll get, you know, I'll get ahead. No. It just doesn't happen. If I do, then the next day I'm like not even getting out of bed. So <laughs> I need to get on this slow and steady <laughs> train. Um, I guess that's what I'm doing. But it's weird not having that like extra thing that I used to have right. and was able to like pull out when needed. But I mean, yeah. I I don't know. I feel like sleep is more important than than ever. I had a um, visited family over the weekend, and I had to, to. Well, the sleeping arrangements weren't super ideal. It was okay, but I didn't sleep well, and I was was too tired for anything on Sunday. <laughs> We're just two so, middle aged developers. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> The younger people listening to this is like, what's up with old people? They just complain about sleep and and like energy. And it's, like, <laughs> it's a struggle, okay? It's a struggle, young person. <laughs> but what yeah. have you been able to do since you're feeling so organized? Uh, yeah, like I've been um, moving forward with my to-do list stuff. I, I feel like that's working quite well. Uh, still trying to plan out the day uh, before I get to work, like first thing in the morning, and uh, being also being mindful about like not overloading my to do list. Um, and it's kind of nice. So when I'm I'm done early with my to do list for the day, I actually stop working. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, maybe that also helps with managing my energy a little bit better. Um, but anyways, uh, I talked about this last week a little bit so jane has been doing a lot of customer interviews and we finally figured out what the next big thing is we're going to work on um Ooh. it's going to be reporting so um basically stats about how your messages are doing um in terms of opens and clicks and deliveries and stuff like that over a um well over a certain time period um, in theory, we have some of the data these days already, but we're not we're not doing a good job at showing showing that data. So we only show aggregates over the entire lifetime or like over the entire existence of a message or a broadcast, and we're not breaking those down by by date and stuff like that. So um, the challenge will be to come up with a new database structure to support that, some roll up tables and, and fancy stuff like that. Um, and then a little bit of UI on top of that, but we're making a deliberate choice not to overthink it and not to make it too complicated. <laughs> um, so this shouldn't be a feature that takes ages to build, but maybe maybe a, a, a few weeks or so, and and that's it, and then then roll it out and then build it up from there. I guess the interesting challenge will be to get the database schema set up in a way that is like performant and scales for the future. Um, and then we can, once we figure that one out, I guess it's relatively easy to, to add new stuff. So for example, we also want to do like stats for segments over time. So you can see like how, how segments grew over time or shrinked over time. And when maybe there was a big influx of people getting into a segment or leaving a segment and stuff like that. 
but for now, like first step is reporting for messaging and then let's see what we can do next. So yeah, it's exciting to finally finally know what the next big thing is. <laughs> um, to be honest, it was our hunch that this will be a, a thing we should do, um, but it's good to have like some, yeah, some actual feedback from customers that they they actually want that and actually looking forward to that. So, so far, no work has been done on it, but at least we know what we should do next. And um, once I'm done with a little bit of maintenance stuff, um, I'm going to focus on getting the database set up for that. And then, uh, yeah, hopefully we'll report more in the next couple of weeks. So this will then not be, it will not be going back. Like you will start collecting the data you need. You don't already have the data you need and will kind of back report. Sort of. So the one problem with this is, in theory, we have all the data that we need to do this like backwards as well, except for users that you deleted from your system. So if you send an email to 100 uh, users, but you deleted five of them, we will not be able to restore the numbers for those five users. So to get accurate data, we actually have to store it separately from the users um, and not like try to backfill it from the user data or the event data. But I guess as a, as a crutch or whatever to be like, to get some helpful data from day one, I guess we just backfill it and then have a note somewhere in the documentation that says, yeah, like it's only a hundred percent accurate after this date. And before that, it's more like an estimate. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I guess that's a good, yeah, 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 a good way to to handle this. Still, so, still get the useful data, but uh, maybe not like super accurate. Yeah, depending on people's use case, that could be very accurate or very non-accurate, depending on how much cleaning they <laughs> right. do of their <laughs> of their exactly customer list or their. But I, I guess like it will be still be helpful to get like a general idea how does how the campaign is performing or, or things like that. So it's just all be in like helpful data so yeah, yeah absolutely absolutely yeah and then um related to database stuff uh we're also kicking off uh a project to migrate from heroku postgres to uh, crunchy data crunchy um, data database. <laughs> crunchy data so yeah that's crunchy the name of the company <laughs> it sounds like a cereal Captain yes, Crunch. Isn't there something called Captain Crunch or something in the States? It sounds a little bit like is. a cereal. They should start sending it out is, cereal yeah. boxes. That would be really funny. Like when you sign up as a customer, you get like a little cereal box right, yeah. with like crunchy data. And then there could be little like statistics symbols or something that they could have made. <laughs> <laughs> they should totally do that. I yeah. mean, crunchy data, if you need merch help, let me know. <laughs> If you need merch ideas, please reach out to. Um, yeah, anyways, um, they seem to be like a good like managed Postgres provider. And a lot of the original Heroku Postgres team is now working at Crunchy. So it felt like a good, a good choice. And um, if things work out, as I hope they will, um, we'll get a little bit of better performance for less money so it feels like an obvious an obvious step to take um and um i also figured because it's december and there's a the, the christmas break is coming up that christmas break week feels like a good opportunity to <laughs> to do that migration because things will probably be a little bit slower um maybe yeah, do the... you usually see do you usually see a slowdown over the christmas breaks or can you see kind of the holidays in your data um, I actually haven't checked like incoming data, but from customer support and all of that, it's a lot slower for us. At least it has been in the past. And I'm s suspecting that it will also be true for like the overall load on the system because we can totally see weekends. Like we can, we can look at our metrics and know which one was Saturday and Sunday just by looking at the, the amount of data that we receive. So I'm pretty sure we'll be able to see Christmas as well. Um, but I don't have hard proof, but yeah. 
good thing because to, uh, just I'll, I'll check it out anecdotally i guess i don't know where i read this but like a long time ago i read that one of the biggest email opening days is christmas day so if you huh which is weird because you think like oh everybody's home like with their family they're not you know looking to read emails but but this might have changed because this was er like earlier days of you know iPhones and stuff like that and maybe i read this like 10 years ago so this is like do not take this as advice <laughs> but i think All the right. hypothesis then was that a lot of people get new gadgets and then they play with their gadgets and when mm. they're playing with their gadgets, they're like, oh, I'll open this random marketing email <laughs> that I would never have opened <laughs> if it wasn't for this new gadget right. um, or something like that. Or just people being like, I don't know, post family bonanza, like they need a little kind of time. <laughs> they need a little own. bit marketing email opening. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, this was before like the prevalence of social media. I think I read this, so that might not be true anymore. People will, might just be like mindlessly scrolling social media and not mindlessly scrolling their email the anymore. Email inbox. <laughs> yeah. I mean, when I read it, I was just like, be, what? <laughs> there might still be something to it, but um, as most of our customers are B2B apps, I still think like usage of B2B apps will be down. Um, so I guess, yeah, we yeah. just go and for And this it. was just Christmas Day, week, and then you have, like, the rest of the week, right? Nobody does anything yeah. on, like, the third day of Christmas. It's, like, a non-day. It's between Christmas. At least in Norway, there's this tradition. I've never done it, though, but it's a tradition to write these Christmas letters where you kind of chronicle your family's adventures for the year, and then you send them right before Christmas. And I read this super funny essay about how, especially the time then between Christmas Eve and New Year's Eve, it's, like non-time that's where you can do whatever like it's not gonna get into <laughs> the christmas letter because that kind of restarts on january 1st um yeah right. so he, he was like this saying, is not going all. to be chronicled <laughs> this will what not happens be chronicled. between what happens between christmas and new year stays between christmas and new year <laughs> exactly um and i also feel like those are really good relaxation days um anyways but but yeah well that's uh norwegian christmas traditions for you uh, yeah yeah i guess it's similar around here i mean yeah it's usually it's usually a slow week and um yeah why don't we spice this up spice it up by migrating our huge database from one provider to another <laughs> why take the time off like everybody else benedict <laughs> just work uh, actually bed. taking the week bef the week before christmas off so i feel like yeah i will be working between christmas and new year's Okay. Also, someone has to do customer support, and our customer support person is taking the time off. So, someone has to do it. <laughs> someone has to do it. <laughs> the joys of running a small team, right? Right. Being, being Anyways, um, anyways, we don't we don't expect this to be a huge thing. Like from early conversation with them, it's like fifteen minutes of downtime or so max. So, ideally, this will be super smooth and straightforward, but. Yeah, we we'll see. I'll report back. <laughs> Either with a disaster or a success story. <laughs> Everybody can look forward to week one of Slow and Steady 2023 for, <laughs> for the success story, of course, of migration. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, so what's been going on on your end? You know, full steam ahead with Prune Your Follows. Uh, it's a lot of fun. People are nice. unfollowing. I have not aggregated the data either, um, which is on my to-do list before the product hunt lunch is to create a little section on the marketing page that kind of tallies up how many unfollows have happened in the app since mm. kind of day one, um, which I think is starting to be quite a few. Like we have 78 users as of... 15 minutes ago or half an hour ago. I checked right before we got on this recording. Um, so that's quite good. And then I think there's like, what was it? Like six, 63,000 or 70, like a lot of our records in the accounts table. Um, so that's kind of fun to see. Like, I don't, I don't have any production apps that like have a lot of data like that because with POW, you know, everything is encrypted. So everyone has their own little database or like little data. Um, storage 
but here you can actually I can actually go in and there's like I can see a table with like thousands and thousands of rows which is which is new for me which is which is kind of fun uh which also you know leads to new challenges <clears throat> because more users people use things in different ways um so far like the the feedback has been really good i think i said some last week and then this week we got a uh, uh, omg this is amazing i've already unfollowed almost 50 accounts and i thought uh oh because i know that the twitter rate limit on unfollowing is 50 accounts per 15 minutes and i haven't handled that case in the app like <laughs> it will just start failing and then i think like two minutes after i got an updated reply on twitter i think i'm hitting a rate limit and i'm like yes <laughs> you are hitting a rate limit um and so the architecture at this point like i don't save your access token so i cannot refresh your access token um if i want to do that there will actually be a little notice when you log in with twitter saying that i will have access kind of app offline access to your all your Twitter accounts and kind of do whatever I want. <laughs> um, so mm. I haven't done that yet. So I cannot kind of save these unfollows up and then unfollow for you later. Like that could be like a pro feature in the f pro feature in the future. You know, if if uh, Printer Follows ever gets to that point. Um, so I'm thinking I need to add like a little bit of error handling. That's like, hey, you know, you're not allowed to unfollow any more people, but maybe sign up for this reminder, and we'll send you a reminder every Friday to go and do some unfollow Friday action. Um, so I think I should probably have that in place before the product hunt lunch, because uh, it seems like people get into the unfollowing. They're just like unfollow, unfollow, unfollow. Like I was, I was much more like. I don't know. I just did a couple and like had to think about who I wanted to unfollow and, uh, and stuff like that. But some people are just going in there and just like unfollowing, which is cool, which is cool. Um, but then on the other side of that is also things might fail for a multitude of reasons. It seems like I'm going into Gatsby Cloud and looking at my functions and it looks like they're not failing, you know, just scrolling through like those logs there. It doesn't really look like things are failing much, um, but I am guessing at this point I will need to do some logging of some sort, uh, which is not just console logging to the um, functions on Gatsby Cloud. Um, so, you know, I could use like Sentry, I guess, but then I also thought that I could maybe just do some rudimentary logging to a table in SATA because they kind of, they market that they have this feature they call analytics platform or metric aggregation where you can like which like this is marketing copy. I just copied it off. Create extremely performant analytics at scale from unique counts to averages, slice and dice your data with real, re near real time aggregations. So I thought maybe I can just like dump it in there and not have to like work with another provider. But you can tell me if that's just stupid or not. That's just stupid. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> oh, do I need to set up another account? I don't want to set up any more accounts. Okay. What should I do? Uh, yeah, use something like Sentry or uh, was this Roll Rollbar or Bug Snack or like one of those or App Signal or any of those tools because ultimately you don't really just don't just only want um, error messages but you also want to backtrace and maybe know which line this was on and and, and all of that stuff and if you just dump it into your database, you're not getting any of it. And if you want any of this, you have to build it on top, which just sounds like, no, it's not like not worth your time. It's easier to just sign up for a new account any, uh, on any of those tools. <laughs> I guess I'll have to. I think I have a Sentry account laying around somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> I'll see if I can reactivate it. Usually, if I if I go back and like get one of my old plans, I usually I don't think I'm paying for Sentry though. But sometimes, like I have these legacy plans on places that I've tried <laughs> before, and I have like a cheap plan. <laughs> but I think hopefully I'm gonna stay within the free tire of like Sentry or something like that. I guess they're pretty lenient, right, on like how much data you can give them. And then I guess like they, um, it's usually how long they store it, I think, is often where they cut it off. Yeah, I think it depends a little bit on the provider, but um, I'd be careful about like 
maybe finding one that just cuts you off at some point. Like if there's too much incoming data, they just stop processing it. Mm -hmm. uh, because there are some, and I'm not entirely sure which one it was, that will just like bill you for the overage. <laughs> um, yeah, and if uh, this like goes viral at some point, I do not want to be billed yeah, for that. I just want to lose all that this. data. I just want to lose yeah, it all yeah. and just pretend it yeah. never happened. <laughs> exactly. So um, that's the one thing I'd look out for. But uh, other than that, like those tools are really great. Yeah. Okay, I'll give it a try. Is there any tips to like, is there any gotchas on how to use them? Or if I just follow tutorials, do, is it usually straightforward? Or is it like typically something I would do wrong? Like not give it enough data or give it too much data or? Uh, I think most of them should just hook into, into JavaScript or, like, or the browser's error handling mm -hmm. and just do all the work for you. Mm -hmm. And then you can go usually go crazy with um with them where they where they also track like breadcrumbs of like the pages people visited before and mm -hmm. I don't know stuff like that yeah but yeah I'll okay yeah so that would be the browser one yeah that. yeah I was thinking mostly that I needed to to have some logging on the functions that are doing like the big chunk of work but of course if I get a tool that can go on both sides I can just put it into the browser as well yep yeah, because yeah, this is like, yeah, because I've never done any or not never, but like for POW, I don't want to do logging in the browser because I'm so scared. I'll accidentally collect people's unencrypted data. So I kind of just <laughs> postpone yeah. that part. And I do have some, I think I have some sensory logging actually on that those functions. So I can go and look at what I did there. But of course, for this app, which like all the data is publicly available anyway. So like even if I get any kind of breach, like it's not, it's not like a super, super scary thing. So maybe I should just like collect all the things like everyone else usually does. This is this is strange for me. Like I've been so <laughs> for so long, I like worked on a product where it's like, oh, I can't send them emails if they haven't, you know, and got to think about the privacy. And then, oh, I don't want to log too much because suddenly I'm like logging, you know, text inputs that are supposed to be secret and, and stuff like that. But with Prunier Follows, it's it's all of it is is public because even if you're following somebody that um is private the follow information is still public so even just with my regular app token not like a user's actual personal access token i can still get all of this information um so it's like a mind shift um in like how i'm thinking about a lot of things which is which is this is easier <laughs> yeah <laughs> much easier much much easier um but yeah, okay, so I'll try to report back on how my logging journey uh, yeah, is next week because it should be in place. Looking by forward then. to hear how it's going. Yeah, because so we were. What your, yeah. What, what are your plans for the product hunt launch? That sounds like it's coming, coming up. It's coming up. So the plan was to do it on Thursday, the 8th, but then Seda is in contact with this product hunt hunter. That's now a career, it seems like, um, where people <laughs> who have been on the platform for a long time, they will like hunt your product. And then if they hunt it, you're further up on the on the front page or you get featured more easily or something like that so that you're more visible in the early, you know, in the first hours before everyone is, is kind of segregated based on votes. So it kind of gives you an advantage. Um, so there's been some back and forth. And then I think maybe um, the plan was then on the 9th. But then I'm feeling really crappy. And then Ula just got a cold. And I am like relying on his kind of shameless DMing of people to get our numbers up. Because <laughs> uh, I have a really hard time doing that. Like he doesn't, you know, talk to people like he doesn't cold dm people but like he will like sms our friends and be like go upvote you don't even know what product it is but you need to go and upvote like he he is that kind of person so i need to beat him to kind of be <laughs> on point for this too and since he's got a cold and like i'm sensing that i might get it like i yeah so we haven't decided 100 percent yet so this when this podcast comes out you might go be able to go and upvote right away um but if not, send me DM and I will DM you when you should go and upvote. <laughs> um, so other than that, I just need to get a lot of assets ready. There needs to be like a video on top or like a GIF makes it better. Um, and then there's the kind of story behind the product. 
then there should be like a comment. I think like I should, there should be a description, but then there should also be a comment from me uh, as one of the first comments where I'm like more personal and, um, and then like keeping the pressure up on Twitter and like in all the communities. So you'll be seeing me. If you're in a community with me, I will be spamming you to upload. Um, <laughs> But I think that's about it. Um, a friend or a friend from one of these communities actually ran through the open. What's it called? That chat bot that everybody's been talking about this week on Twitter. Open chat. chat. GPG. 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 Um, GPT. 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 We'll add the um, the link to the tweet in the description because he kind of ran through what should I do for a successful product hunt launch. And... Mm -hmm. uh, there was some pretty good advice and I could see where some of it was coming from because somebody had sent me the link to a blog post made by, is it Corey Haynes behind Savvy Cal, who is like written, which seems like a really good kind of um, blog post about what you need to do for product hunt. And I feel like this chat bot, it was like, I didn't go, I didn't have time because I was last night. I didn't have time to actually go and compare them, but it sounded very much like Corey's blog post. <laughs> um, but still, but then the next question, which I think was much, much more interesting is like, what are some good tweets to market prune your follows, which is a tool to unfollow people on Twitter or something like that? Like pretty straightforward question. And the tweets were so good. I'm like stealing those. I didn't remember, but they were like, they didn't say exactly that. They were like, for a calmer feed, unfollow people, use pruner follows. And um, like, there were some really nice phrasings in there that I will just steal um, <laughs> because nice. th those were good. So that just blew my mind. I haven't had time to play with it anymore. And let's not talk about the ethical implications of these tools, but um, the little tweets that, that came out of it was um was cool yeah i played around with it as well last week and part of me is very impressed and the other part of me is very unimpressed um so i had a good conversation with the chatbot about um a pretty complex database architecture issue and it suggested a solution that didn't make sense to me. So I asked a question and it explained it to me. And in the end, it made sense. <laughs> <laughs> so that, 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 was, that, that, that was a good experience in, in terms of I feel stupid and had to ask the AI to explain it to me. Um, but then on Sunday, for fun, I asked it about recipes to Black Forest Ghetto, like mm -hmm. uh, famous German cake, I guess. And it... I don't know. It was just stupid. <laughs> <laughs> like the the recipe included that um, you you bake um, you bake the dough, then get it out of the oven, and while still hot, put whipped cream on it, which sounds like <laughs> the stupidest idea ever. That is the stupidest idea ever. <laughs> and I complained to it, and it said, "Oh yeah, that's right. Uh, the the cream will just melt." So I was like, "Yeah, that, and there's also no cherry spirit in it." And it just replaced the cream with cherry spirit. So <laughs> you're just going to pour? Which also does sound like well, a good idea. I mean, that doesn't sound like such a bad idea. <laughs> I don't know. Like, I mean, a little bit of cherry spirit is nice. But then if you just like don't have any cream and soak it in just cherry spirit, that, I don't know. Yeah. Anyways, if you are uh, baking or a confectioner or anything, your jobs are safe. If you're a developer, maybe not so much. <laughs> But that is super interesting because I've been thinking like a lot about databases for some reasons lately, probably because I'm, you know, working with Zeta. Um, But also like a lot of the things that we've been talking about, back, like things that we keep coming back to on the show. And that was a topic among some of us when I was at Jamstack.conf. And that's like, okay, the databases are getting kind of, they're doing all kinds of innovation you know, with edge this and edge that or, you know, and, and all kinds of things. But then like the hard thing is data modeling, right? Like, and when you get the data model right, everything else is so much easier. And I know you've said that a couple of times and I've seen other people too, like you're working through a problem or you want to create a feature for your existing product. And it's like, it's, it's like, it's stuck. Like you can't get there because the data model is kind of in your way. 
So if we could all chat with this chat bot about our data model, <laughs> but where is it getting its information? Well, um, yeah, but like learning, and I, I'm wondering like, how can you learn to be a better data model? How can you learn to create better data models with that? Well, I guess you have to put in the work, but like at now it's mostly like, oh, you'll just have to do it a lot and experiment, but like how many people get to create like a ton of different products, right? So, yeah, like how can we teach it or like help people get better at it? Or me, people, let's just let's just be honest, me. How can I become better at data modeling? That's something I'm thinking about. Send me your best resources, um, <laughs> everyone. I, I guess one part of it, as you said, is just like putting in the work and then like doing more side projects, but I guess the critical part is like doing it for the learning exercise and not for launching a side business. What? Because <laughs> I feel like that's I the... Have, I don't have to launch everything, every project I do for fun? Yes, exactly. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> well, now I just feel hurt. <laughs> I just need to stop there. Um, no, but I feel like a lot of the issues that you run into, you don't run into in that kind of learn, like, play phase of creating a project or product because i feel like i got that down and i also have like the data modeling experience or experience or theory from university and stuff so i can like i think i'm fairly good at like the initial kind of thinking around it but then you run into problems and those problems you don't run into them if they're not in production or like you're adding features because it's when you're starting to change because of customer demand or like research and you want to add a feature you didn't think about initially, that's when, that's when the interesting stuff happens. Yeah. Also true. But then again, <laughs> those are the problems you know, don't know about until they hit you. Right. <laughs> yes. But having more experiences with them will probably make you better at them. But then also how often does this happen <laughs> if you're actually working on one side project and not <laughs> a million um yeah well these were just some not that well um articulated <laughs> thoughts uh, but well, if you haven't... i guess the summary is doing more of it is always a good idea <laughs> always a good idea but i would love some resources and i would love like if there is you know a cause i remember reading some of the patterns books when it comes to software development which i found really interesting like these are known problems or no known things that come up again and again in um when you're developing and here, here are some patterns like there's some some very um very well-known books that i now don't remember around like design patterns and i'm thinking there should be something similar for like databases like oh you know Ta like tagging tagging of things like this go happens again and again like there should be kind of recipes or like patterns or something i feel like there should exist like a directory resource something about what you should think about and what are some possible approaches so if you know about yeah. something like that send it my way yeah that would be interesting indeed because like yeah. a lot of these things are solved by someone many many <laughs> many times very true yeah yeah i guess that's it that's it for the entire that's... week nothing else nothing else <laughs> nothing else okay. well in about a couple of minutes i will be interviewing someone i met at a conference james q quick he's got 170k youtube subscribers that's 170,000 youtube subscribers which I, that just blows my mind. I know people, some people even have more, but that is just insane. And he just went full time on content creation. And since I'm now like in a way in the kind of like DevRel for hire content creation business that I kind of like fallen into, I thought I'll do some research on like, how like does the business side of these things work for the people who are doing it on that scale and just trying to learn as much as I can around you know, how sponsorship works, like how many subscribers do you need to have to start getting good pay? <laughs> and what do you actually sell? Do you sell like trials or viewership or just the potential to reach a lot of people? Like, how does this all work? I'm going to try to get James to answer these things um, 
truthfully on his channel um, and it's open for everyone. So that can be interesting to see what other people want to say as well, because I've read and seen a lot of stuff around how to create content and how to become like better at it and faster at it. But often kind of the financial side is often a little bit hush hush. Uh, but yeah. James was like, I'm open. I was like, okay, I'll ask you a question on there then. <laughs> we'll see how that um, how that goes. So cool. Cool. And then I can share next week. Awesome. Then uh, good luck with that. Uh, I hope it goes well. And then uh, see you around the interwebs. See you around the interwebs. Bye.